Darwin's work, natural selection in the passing of genes. Yeah. There's Charles Darwin right there. It's a picture of him in his younger days. Likely about the time he went on the HMS Beagle around the world on a ship. It took five years. Uh, but he's most well known for this theory of natural selection and evolution, this process in which uh, certain traits uh, come about and are present in certain species, all species in fact. So um, some things about Charles. He was a pretty good student, wasn't sure what he wanted to do. Finally told his rich dad, maybe I should go on a two-year trip and be the naturalist on this ship that was going to be there to survey the land and uh, be the scientist and study animals and stuff. So that's what he did. Uh, other things about Charles was, and this is really weird to me and maybe to you, that he married his first cousin and they had about 10 kids together. Which, uh, as he learned more about the passing on of genes, genetics, uh, he discovered why some of his kids might have been uh, weaker and more prone to illness uh, than the average person. Uh, so, yeah, he was married to his first cousin, which doesn't have as, as much, hopefully, today, because uh, mixing those genes, you kind of want a little more variation than people with the same grandparents. Okay, kids? All right. Here's Charles, and here's the route in the upper right. Uh, let's take a look at this here. Uh, so, yeah, he started out in England. He's an English dude. Uh, he, uh, yeah, went around the world. It was supposed to last about two years, but they studied enough and were surveying the land enough that it took actually closer to five years. Uh, it was on this trip that he really made some important uh, observations. I won't say discoveries. I mean, the things that he were was studying, wildlife, plants, animals, had existed there for millions of years that way, although uh, it had never been quite uh, fully explained to the extent that he did. So he really made some ground make, uh, ground breaking work uh, studying the animals mostly um, in Ecuador here and off the coast of Ecuador is a series of islands called the Galapagos Islands. You could still go there today. Um, and I've had students actually visit this place and it's it's a place where there are so many wild animals and plants that are so uniquely suited to their environment. So Charles was thinking why are they so uniquely suited to their environment because he would see some animals on the mainland of South America and Ecuador that were very similar to the animals that he found on the Galapagos Islands, only there were small changes and most of those changes had to do with uh, their environment. For example, uh, in Ecuador there was a kind of sloth that had claws that were very thin and very good for climbing trees. That's how that species of sloth got its food. Uh, others, uh, there was another species of sloth um, and then iguanas too that, that were uniquely suited to finding food uh, on the rocks around the islands of the Galapagos. So um, he found this uh, all over the islands uh, that he studied and he came up with this hypothesis that over time uh, the island organisms changed from those on the mainland uh, in order to survive. Okay, one thing that he studied a lot uh, was adaptations, and that was kind of a new term back in his day. Uh, now we know adaptations to be basically things that are that help an organism survive and reproduce. Okay, for finches, for example, this is, you know how Mendel had his pea plants that he studied? Uh, Charles Darwin, a lot of the time, is known for his work with the Galapagos finches. Uh, he noticed that according to the kind of weather, so if, if it was a rainy year, uh, there, 
he would see more finches with very uh, short and pointed beaks. Uh, this was because during a uh, rainy uh, year, uh, a year with a lot of precipitation, there were a lot of insects around. And the most successful in surviving, the most successful finches in surviving and reproducing were those that had beaks that were really good for eating insects. In other years, uh, the only food available were seeds, uh, seeds that were sometimes hard to get at uh, without powerful, uh, strong beak, such as you see in the upper left. So uh, in drought years, he actually noticed that uh, the finches that were most able to survive were the ones that were good at getting the food. This makes sense to us, uh, but at the time it was kind of groundbreaking. So a lot of his theories about natural selection and how these animals got adaptations uh, was formed from his work on that on that ship. Um, if you look at other animals, there's just crazy adaptations that, that allow these organisms to survive and reproduce. Cheetahs have developed this awesome speed uh, that allow it to catch its prey. Um, they can run up towards 70 miles an hour. Uh, even plants like flowers have, have developed this ability to uh, make itself attractive to bees that might pollinate it and thus uh, extend those genes from those flowers onto the next generation because they're pollinated by bees. The more attractive they are and the more attractively colored they are, the more they attract the bees that can do that for them. Uh, there are absolutely crazy adaptations out in the wild. Uh, one of my favorite uh, might be this angler fish. I'll show you, I'll give you the link to the video in your Google Doc on the show notes. The, the, the animal just looks completely uh, like an alien, uh, yet it's perfectly suited for the environment that it lives in. Another video you absolutely have to watch is the, the video that shows this lyre bird mimicking other sounds that it hears in order to attract a mate. Uh, it's spot on, uh, even with like a, other birds, obviously, um, but it also mimics the sounds that it hears like a camera uh, shutter or uh, actually a chainsaw. It, you just have to hear it um, to believe it almost, so check that out too. Uh, so some of these are actually helpful for getting food. Some of the some of these are more for attracting mates. Uh, so this all makes sense. Uh, this is a, a short video. I think I'll just include it in the show notes. One thing that uh, here's what the video is. It's Bill Nye explains evolution with emoji. Um, to me, it's way oversimplifying something that's very very complex, and he seems to make or jump to conclusions very simply and quickly uh, without explaining some of the science behind it yet it can be seen as a decent uh, resource if when you're first learning about something like evolution uh, which is a gradual change in a species over time uh, there are different kinds of evolution macro evolution and micro evolution uh, but these are all this is a theory uh, which is a well-tested concept that ex attempts to explain observations. You can't uh, prove it right or wrong necessarily. You can, it's only a series of observations that you think um, are explained well uh, by a theory. So um, this theory of natural selection and evolution is just an attempt at explaining why we see the variation in the number of species that we do. All right, so natural selection is really uh, the motor uh, to make this whole uh, engine go. Uh, it's the process by which individuals that are better adapted to their environment, more fit, uh, you could say, are more likely to survive and reproduce. So the survival of the fittest might not be a full definition, uh, but it's kind of the idea behind natural selection. Different environments, different traits are going to lead to different amounts of uh, or a different ability to survive and reproduce. And those are the ones that pass on their genes. I think one of the best examples of natural selection, perhaps the best uh, example of natural selection 
uh, that I can think of is a response uh, that bacteria have uh, to antibiotics. Usually antibiotics will kill uh, nearly all of the, the population of bacteria in your body. Uh, the ones that survive are the ones that are resistant, that can withstand uh, the drug, that antibiotic. So guess which ones pass on their genes to the next generations? The ones that are um, not as susceptible to being killed by antibiotics. So the one, the result is you end up with stronger uh, bacteria that we can that can withstand a typical normal antibiotic. Uh, so the change in population over time uh, is that result of natural selection. Uh, I'll include this video in the show notes as well. It's why do some species uh, thrive in the city? Uh, so, I mean, some species such as raccoons, rats, beetles uh, are really well suited to the environment of a city, a man-made uh, building, sidewalks, etc. So, um, that's a pretty interesting look at how organisms can be well suited to their environment. Uh, there's a number of ways in which natural selection uh, can occur, and we've I've cited some examples in the past. Uh, sometimes the the amount of rainfall will change the beak, like with the finches. So that is something that is selected for uh, because it allows them to get food better. Um, there are a lot of other strategies that species use to survive and reproduce as well. Some of them overproduce the number of larvae um, in the case of like these grasshoppers that that create a huge plague um, in some cases, but they produce more lava or more eggs in the case of these uh, sea turtles than can possibly survive. Uh, so which ones end up uh, surviving the ones that can get to the ocean in the case of these sea turtles. Unfortunately for most of them they're picked off by birds and eaten uh, before they're there. So only the ones that uh, can survive um, are the ones that uh, pass on their genes to the next generation. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of competition. There can be competition for food uh, there can be competition between members of that same species and getting to reproduce too, which is why you see uh, elephant seals go at it. Uh, these are males fighting uh, for the right to mate with the females and the harem of females that they will control if uh, they are the winner in a fight. So um, competition for mates, competition for food is also something that will be selected for. Um, maybe the peacock and why, why does it have a huge plume of feathers uh, like that? It's because males are trying to impress the female and they can do so if they have just a crazy large and uh, colorful uh, tail feathers that, in that formation. Weird. Um, variation is something that um, is important with natural selection. You do need to have uh, variation in the gene pool. Um, you need to have certain alleles present and variation within that so that those traits that are desirable are selected for. Um, I have a picture of bats here because sometimes bats that live in just one location, uh, like one cave for example, and there's millions of these bats in just one cave, they don't have a lot of genetic variation. And that can be dangerous because then if one of them is susceptible so, to a disease that's invasive in that cave, uh, they all, if one dies, a lot of the others will die as well because they have the same genes. Um, so that can be a problem if there's not enough variation within the same population of organisms. Uh, I'll leave you with uh, this video. It was made by the American uh, Natural History Museum and uh, it kind of explains how natural selection works. Life on this planet lives within a very thin region called the biosphere, but it's amazing how variable that is in terms of temperature, in terms of pressure, in terms of different environments, wet, dry, hot, cold. The animals and plants that live in these places didn't always live there, and those environments are changing. Organisms within a population have variation, and they pass down this information to their offspring. 
If that information or those characteristics provide some advantage to the offspring, they're more likely to survive. And those that are more likely to survive, then are more likely to reproduce, then that trait can spread through the population and become established. So you get things spreading through populations that allow organisms to maybe move into a new environment and differentiate. Think of a cave fish, they tend to lose their eyes, they don't need them anymore, they lose their pigment, it's costly to produce pigment. So they're specifically adapted to live in a particular environment. And that's why we see all these spectacular forms, because over a long enough period of time, these changes do spread through populations, they confer an advantage, and you get all this diversity that you'll see and you'll be exposed to in this exhibition. All right, so that's natural selection. Uh, that's Charles Darwin. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what you guys can do in this unit. Uh, we'll see you next time.